and begin with that overall general will of God for us. As it's explained there, it's page 1031, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that is God's will for us, you see. And there it is again in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, your being made completely like him. And of course, being made completely like him means that your spirit and soul and body will be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's God's will for our bodies. We ought to see that plainly. Uh, that was not the state of our bodies after we rebelled against God, you remember. We became independent of God, and our bodies suffered the same kind of uh, death, really, that our souls and our, sp uh, our spirits suffered. You find it there in Genesis 3 and 19. Genesis 3 and 19. That uh, as we rebelled against God, so we suffered death in our spirits and death in our souls and death in our bodies. Genesis 3 and 19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. You are to dust, and to dust you shall return. And death, and all that leads up to death and the way of sickness, resulted from us rebelling against God. And really it worked just this way. If we had followed God's will, we would have received his approval continually on our lives. Our consciences would have been clean. We would have sensed that the Father and the heaven above enjoys us and approves of us. There would have been a freedom from any strain. When we lacked that approval by rebelling against him, we began to try to justify ourselves. And we entered into all the strain of trying to justify ourselves and prove ourselves to everybody. And that brought all the strain and stress diseases that bring too much adrenaline and an acid into the stomach and bring the ulcers and create all the sicknesses that come from strain and stress. If we had really obeyed God, we would have enjoyed just doing what he wanted us to do. That would have been all the enjoyment we needed. But when we didn't receive that enjoyment of operating and exercising our personalities fully in the way he wanted us to, then we wanted to get enjoyment for ourselves. And so you remember we turned hunger into gluttony and we turned the desire to reproduce ourselves into lust. And lust and gluttony brought a whole series of diseases and sicknesses with them. And our bodies became weak and out of shape. And if we had listened to God, we would have had pure direction about how we should use the world. Instead of that, we misused the world. And we perverted the world itself. And we used it actually to harm us and to bring other diseases to us. And so, you see, disease set in on top of sin and is a direct result of sin. No doubt even viruses and germs would not be in the world if we loved each other enough to keep clean and to keep pure and to maintain the world under God's will and in submission to his plan. But because of that, all these sicknesses followed. And that was the result, really. It was because of that that we read in Romans 8 and 20 to 22 what God did. Romans 8 and 20 to 22. Because really the whole world suffered this kind of fall, you see. Romans 8 and 20 and 22. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning and travelled together until now. And so the whole natural creation fell into that same kind of strain. And that, coupled with us men and us women, resulted in us having minds that were impaired and emotions that were unbalanced and bodies that became very, very weak. Really so weak that we're only a shadow 
of the great giants of people that we were at the very beginning of creation. Now, God himself always connects up sickness with this rebellion against him. He really does, brothers and sisters. God always connects the two up together. You can see it there in Romans 8 and verse 2. Romans 8 and 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And that's the law of sin and death, you see. That as we rebelled against God, we lacked his approval, we fell into justifying ourselves, we created strain and stress in our bodies, resulting in all the adrenaline pumping into the stomach and the acid and bringing the diseases that come with stress. It resulted in that lack of direction so that we perverted the world and misused it against ourselves. It resulted in a seeking enjoyment through lust and gluttony, which in its turn weakened and destroyed our bodies. That's the law of sin and death. And God always connects the two up together. Death is the ultimate result of sickness. And sin and sickness God always sees as a result of us rebelling against them. And you remember, Jesus always connected them both together in his ministry. He always said, I oppose both, not just sin, but sickness also. They're both a result of your rebellion against God. And you remember, you have it there in, oh, Mark 1 and 15. You can really turn to any gospel that describes Jesus' first day in his ministry. And you find that they all emphasize both these sides of his ministry. The emphasis on sin as an enemy of God and the emphasis on sickness. And he opposed both sin and sickness. Mark 1 and 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And Jesus first called men to turn from sin. And then 22 to 23, he opposed sickness. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Seemed as soon as Jesus appeared, sickness exposed itself. And then you remember that Jesus deals with the sickness. And Jesus always connected the two together. Uh, if you look at Matthew 9 and 5, he entrusted uh, our victory over both to us, really, to the apostles and therefore to us in Matthew 9 and verse 5. Rather, in there, there he connected the two up together, I'm sorry, Matthew 9 and 5. For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? And Jesus obviously saw a connection between the sickness and the sin, uh, because he mentioned that both of, either of those would deal with the case at hand. And you remember last Sunday was suggested that why he so often dealt with sickness was the Jews and the Gentiles at that time found it easier to believe in healing than they did in forgiveness of sins. Now, in our day, it's almost the other way around. And then he entrusted uh, to us, really, the job of removing both, you know, when he sent out the apostles and said, you are to preach the gospel of the kingdom and you, can, you are to heal all diseases. Now, that is why we say that sin and sickness are connected up together. Now, why did God allow sickness to continue if it wasn't his will? Why did he not come down after the fall of mankind and simply clean up the whole earth and wipe out cancer and wipe out gonorrhea and wipe out leprosy? Why did God not just come down and clean up all sicknesses? Well, the first reason, new ones, is in Genesis 2 and 16 through 17. Genesis 2 and 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. And the very fact that God gave a commandment to man proves that he gave him free will. And God had to allow man to choose what he wanted. Do you see 
that if man chooses rebellion against God and therefore sickness, really God is cancelling out man's free will if he comes down and wipes out sickness. Or if God came down and wiped out sin in every generation, he would really be saying, no, you can only choose it as long as you want. But I'll come down and cancel it out as soon as you die. In other words, the first reason God had to allow sickness to continue was that man had chosen it. And God was determined most of all to make man like himself. And he himself had a free will. So he was committed to preserving man's free will even if he had to let sickness run rampant. The second reason you'll see is in Genesis 3 and verse 4. Genesis 3 and 4. But the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, You will not die. The devil persuaded men but they wouldn't die. They could rebel against God, live independently of him, and they wouldn't die. God had to leave sickness in the world to show man that he would die. Sickness is one of God's ways of showing man that all is not right in creation. You know that the whole world is bent on making it normal and natural to live as if there's no creator. And really, in great parts of the world, that has become almost possible. There are many people who don't think that there's a creator at all. Now, do you see that Satan's job was to persuade us that we'd never die? And God's job was to leave some signs in the earth that we would die, indeed that we were in the process of death. That explains that verse, you remember, that we read, that God subjected the creation to futility. He subjected in, a, in hope. He allowed disease and sickness to come as the natural consequences of our sin so that we ourselves would see that all is not right. And that's the second reason why God allowed sickness to continue. And the third reason really is in 1 Corinthians 11 and 30 through 32. And it's an extension of that last one. 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 30 through 32. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are chastened, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. God left sickness in the world so that man might look at it and see if sickness or death sickness is here, there may be some sin here. And so God left sickness here as a sign to us to at least judge ourselves and see if there is any sin present. And so sickness really can be a real friend, something like the law. Now, I think many of us, you know, say, oh, well, now what? What about old John 9 and 3? And we say, you remember, uh, they asked Jesus, uh, what about this man? Has this man sinned or his parents? And Jesus said, no, this man has not sinned nor his parents. And it is very important for us to see that all God was saying was, because you are sick, it does not necessarily mean that you individually have sinned. Moreover, some of you have been born with a congenital sickness that is there because of your parents' sin or your grandparents' sin or because way back Adam himself sinned. So every time you see someone who is sick, you don't automatically say they've sinned. And that's what Jesus was saying. You remember the man was one who had been born blind. And all that Jesus means there is not everyone who is sick has sinned and brought it upon themselves. Some people are born with congenital sicknesses because the sins of their fathers have been visited on the third and fourth generation. But that is very different, brothers and sisters, as we said last day, from saying that sickness is, has no connection with sin. Sickness is there allowed by God as a consequence of sin to ask us to examine ourselves and see if things are right. Now, why do we say that? Well, because the normal state of God's children 
is expressed in Exodus 15 and 26. Exodus 15 and 26 is the normal state of God's children. And you remember that we, we read it uh, briefly last day. Exodus 15 and 26. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I put upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. In other words, here is a world torn with sin and sickness. And God says, you are my people. And if you avoid sin, then I will put none of the sicknesses upon you that have been put upon the Egyptians. Now, if you know your grammar well enough, you'll know what I mean. If the hypothesis is not true, then one ought to examine if the hypothesis is not true. And if the hypothesis is true, then one ought to examine if the hypothesis is true. And that's why God allowed sickness to continue. You see, the hypothesis is, if you will gently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. That's the hypothesis in a conditional statement. And the hypothesis is, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I put upon the Egyptians. Now that's why God has allowed sickness to continue in the world. So that when we see sickness, we may at least suspect that perhaps there is sin somewhere around. Or perhaps God is trying to say something to us about our relationship with him. In other words, sickness is a bit like the law. You remember the law as it's outlined in Exodus 20. If you receive the spirit of my uncreated life into you, you'll have no other gods before me. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. You will not bear false witness. Those are promises that are true if you're receiving the spirit of God's uncreated life. Now, sickness is a little like the law. God is saying, if you're receiving all the life that flows from my right hand, from my son Jesus, from the tree of life, then really you'll be well. I will put no sicknesses upon you. Now, if you find yourself with some sicknesses, at least be fair and loving enough to ask yourself, am I receiving all the life that God can give me? Now, that's part of the purpose of sickness. And it can be used by God in that way. It's not that God sends sickness. It's that he allows Satan to work this work upon us. Now, I think one of us, some of us have a danger here. We say, you mean every time I have a sickness, I have sinned? No. It could be that God wants you to come into more Christ-likeness. It could be that you haven't sinned at all but that God is anxious for you to come into a new Christ-likeness. Now, you can see this if you look at the teaching that you receive. You remember in Hebrews 12 and 10 about Jesus' own position. Hebrews 12 and 10. And you remember that God is talking about ordinary fathers and how they discipline. And Hebrews 12 and 10. For they disciplined us for a short time at their pleasure. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. Now God at times allows hard things to come upon us so that we might share his holiness. Now, do you see, sharing his holiness is both a negative thing and a positive thing. It's, first of all, being cleared of sins. And secondly, it's growing in Christ-likeness. Now, that's why, at times, God can allow sickness to come upon us. Either because there is sin in our life of some kind, and he wants to draw our attention to it in as loving a way as possible. Or because there's a new position in Jesus 
into which he wants us to come. Now, I think it's important, brothers and sisters, to see the two sides. Otherwise, you won't understand what Jesus meant when he said, just because these Gentiles are suffering, it doesn't mean they've sinned. So some of us may come into a real deep sickness. And it's very important for the rest of us to see that doesn't mean necessarily that that person has sinned. It can mean that that person is far away beyond the stage at at which we are with Jesus. And God is allowing that person to come into a new place with Jesus. Now that ties up with Jesus' own experience. If you look back a few chapters in in Hebrews, in fact, it's it's Hebrews uh, 12, Hebrews 5 and 8. Hebrews 5 and verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. You see that even Jesus suffered, and obviously he didn't sin. Obviously it wasn't because of sin that he suffered, and yet he did suffer so that he would learn perfect obedience. Now at times, God allows sickness to come upon us because there is sin there. And at other times, he allows sickness to come upon us because he wants us to come into a new place in his son Jesus, a new place of growth in Christ-likeness. And I think we have to see both those sides. Now, maybe you can share a wee bit in questions, you know, at the end about that. Do you see then that sickness is really a symptom of a dis-ease that we have with God? Sickness is not God's perfect will for us. And so whenever sickness comes upon us, we should regard it as a symptom. Now, Lord, Why has this sickness come upon me? And God is faithful and he will reveal to us what the real disease is. And God has promised that, you see. He's promised, for instance, in Exodus 15 and 26 that he'll prevent sickness as far as his children are concerned. He will prevent sickness. He says, I will put none of the diseases upon you that I put upon the Egyptians. And secondly, he says, if ever sickness comes upon you, I'll cure sickness. And you remember he said that in James 5 and 16. If you like to just glance at it, you probably know it. The verse, James 5 and verse 16. And you remember it's the promise uh, given to us if we are ever sick. Uh, James 5 and 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another... And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. And God says, you see, if you confess your sins, if you get rid of whatever it is that I'm trying to draw attention to, then as soon as that's removed, your sickness will be healed. If I'm trying to show you how to come into a greater place of faith in my son Jesus, as soon as you come into it, As soon as you confess your lack of Christ-likeness and you see it plainly, then the sickness will be removed. So that is God's promise to us, that he will prevent sickness and that if ever we come into a place where he needs to allow sickness to come upon us, once we have seen whatever he has been trying to point out, he will remove the sickness from us. Now that's God's will for us in regard to sickness. Now, where does this put the whole business of medicine. What is the place of medicine in the sickness of Christians? Probably the place of medicine in the world is the same position as the law. You remember why God gave us the law? It wasn't to make us like Jesus. Uh, Would you look at it there in Galatians 3 and 23, Galatians 3 and 23. The reason God gave us the law. Galatians 3 and 23. Now, before faith came, we were confined under the law. 
kept under restraint until faith should be revealed. And the purpose of the law was to keep us under restraint until faith should be revealed. God gave the law to keep us men and women from blowing apart the world before his redeeming spirit could get to work among us. Now, that was the purpose of the law. You know that you could try to obey the law perfectly in every way, and yet it would never make you like Jesus. The law is there only to keep back sin and to keep back sin from destroying the world. You remember Luther put it this way, there's the power of the sword and there's the power of the spirit. The power of the sword is the power of law, of police officers, of courts, of everything connected with our judicial system. And the purpose of the power of the sword is to control the world and keep men from blowing it apart while the power of the Spirit gets to work through Jesus to redeem men. Now, really, that's probably the same purpose of, of medicine. It's to keep sickness from running rampant throughout the world and destroying the whole world before the Spirit of Jesus can really come into people and make them whole as he is. What then should Christians do about medicine? Well, first of all, you shouldn't immediately you become sick start running for a cure. You shouldn't start running for a cure. Your first question should not be, where can I find a cure? Just the same way, if you had trouble with some brother or sister in the body who was really sinning against you in some way, you wouldn't hand them over to the police. You wouldn't say, I must get rid of this nuisance as soon as I can, whatever way I can do it. So your first question in sickness should be, not where can I find a cure, but Father, why have you allowed this to come upon me? Is there something you're trying to show me in this sickness? Is there some sin that I have in my own life, or is there some new position in Christ that you want me to enter into? This should be our first response, really, to sickness. The issue, you see, isn't really, can Christians use medicine? to get healed. See, there's no problem with that. As long as you uh, don't uh, object to what uh, old Paul called medicine. Now, maybe you'd look at it. 1 Timothy 5 and 23. A lot of you know it already. 1 Timothy 5 and 23. That isn't the issue. uh, Whether Christians can use medicine or not. The answer is obvious there in 1 1 Timothy Five and twenty-three. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So obviously, Paul advised Timothy, listen, there are good nourishing things that will help your body. At times it's good to use those. That isn't the issue, you see. You get into a legal bind. You come under bondage. If you begin to take the position, no, Christians should not uh, use medicine. Christians can use medicine if they want. But do you see that with Jesus, it is a higher thing? And the principle that we follow in regard to sickness is in 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. 1 Corinthians 6 and 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. All things are lawful for us Christians. But there are some things that are lawful, and there are some things that are expedient. And really the question is, am I concerned to find out what God is trying to show me through this sickness, or do I love myself so much that I have to get rid of this pain and suffering at any cost? Do I have to use 
the normal methods that non-Christians use to be healed of my sickness. And do you see, brothers and sisters, there's no question of whether Christians should be doctored or not. Don't you see that? It's the same question, should Christians be lawyers or policemen? Of course they should. As God guides them, they should take part in part of the preserving grace that he has shed throughout the world in the legal systems. Of course they should take part in the whole medical work, which is an attempt of God's preserving grace to hold back sickness in the world so that God's Spirit can get to deal with men. But the issue for Christians is not, is it legal? To be a Christian, is it right to be a Christian? Not as a Christian, is it right to use medicine? But is this what is God's will for me in this present situation? At times it may be God's will for you. But do you see that there are several cautions now that we ought to share with one another as Christians in regard to medicine? I'll try to, you know, take them in, in what detail I can. Often, first of all, Our rush to man's drugs is simply a compounding of our rebellion of self-love against God. Often our rush to man's drugs is just a compounding of the rebellion of our self-love against God. God sees that we love ourselves in some way that is not according to his will. And he allows sickness to come upon us. We rush to drugs to get rid of the sickness in order to carry on without looking at what God was trying to show us. Moreover, some of us are so hurt by the pain of the sickness and we love ourselves so much and we want to avoid suffering at any cost that we are determined to take drugs or anything that will get rid of the pain. Now, do you see that often when we rush to medicine. Now remember what I said, that accepting medicine is lawful to us. But it just is a fact that often we rush to medicine because of our self-love. Because we're not really willing to wait to find out what God is trying to show us. Often we ignore the deeper benefits of the salvation that Jesus has wrought in his death for us by rushing to medicine. Often we take the drugs to clear up the symptoms and actually the disease remains deep down there. And we ignore the depth of the salvation which is wrought in Jesus and which is available to us for a rather shallower, more superficial kind of removal of symptoms. Now often I think that is true, isn't it? Uh, We know the whole business about the Dristan and uh, the the old uh, tiny time capsules. You know, and uh, they really, they just work on the principle that they uh, stop the secretions that God has put in our bodies to clear away virus and germs. And they just stop them. They stop the nose running. They stop all the secretions that really are used by God to take away the sickness. That's just one very clear example of the way we take drugs to suppress and repress symptoms rather than to deal with the real sickness underneath. Now, very often, by running to men's medicines, we ignore and neglect the deeper health and healing that Jesus can bring to us from the cross. Often, in other words, men's medicines heal the physical symptoms, but really don't deal at all with the spiritual sickness that was what God wanted to point out to us. So often we miss the whole purpose of the sickness. Often, really, you know, we say that doctors are God's intermediaries and we thank God for them, and that's right, because they are God's intermediaries. But we ourselves really end up trusting more in the doctors and the drugs than we do in God. Now, that need not be, you see. It need not be. But isn't it true that often that's what happens? It's very important, brothers and sisters, that we see that I'm not saying to you, don't use medicine, because my wife would be out of a job if you did that. So I'm not saying don't use medicine, but I'm saying to you there are cautions that we need to remember as we approach this whole question of sickness.
And the first question we should ask is, Lord, is there anything that you're trying to draw my attention to? I know you're fully able to make me whole and well on your own as soon as the reason for the sickness is removed. Now, is there anything that you're trying to draw my attention to? And that should be our first question. And if our first question, you see, is where can I get a cure, often the things that I'm just sharing are true in our lives. And I think it's true that though all medical knowledge is made possible by God's Spirit, yet often medical knowledge glorifies the cleverness of man rather than glorifying the death of Jesus on the cross. Now that need not be again, but often it is. Often you'll find brothers and sisters, you know, who say, oh, well, the doctor, you know, the doctor is God's method of healing, and so I take the healing as from God. But deep down, they really know better. They know the healing comes from the doctor. Really. They don't believe it comes primarily from the Father because they have tackled it in the wrong way. In other words, it depends on the way you go to medical help. It depends on whether God has directed you to go to that whether you have waited long enough for him to see. Very many of us run to medicine and are so quick to get a cure that we cannot wait long enough to ascertain what God's will is for us. We can't find out why he allowed the sickness to come and we certainly can't find out whether he wants us to go to a doctor or not to go to a doctor. But what God wants is when we come into a problem with sickness to wait upon him, to draw closer to him, That's why he allowed the thing to come to us, so that we would draw closer and nearer to him and understand him better. Instead, you see, many of us draw away from him, and we actually get more independent of him almost because of the sickness than really drawing close. God's will for us, then, in sickness is found there in in Matthew 6 and 25, if you like to look at it. Matthew 6 and 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. That's God's will. When we come into sickness, he wants us not to get away down under the symptoms and start being anxious and worried about our life. He wants us to look up to him and say, Father, I thank you for allowing this to come. I know you're trying to point something out to me because you have said that you will put none of these diseases upon anyone who abides in your statutes. So, Father, I'll wait upon you, and I'll wait for you to show me this. And wait, brothers and sisters, long enough for God to show, you see. Remember, it's in James it says, let steadfastness have its full effect. Don't opt out before God has shown you what he wants to show you. And so he wants you to take that attitude. And as the symptoms bear down on you more and more heavily, he's saying to you, do not love yourself. Do not love yourself. Do not get all wrought up and desire sympathy from other people for your symptoms. Look away from your symptoms and look up to me. And wait upon me. And wait as long as I ask you to wait. And do you see, dear ones, that God may ask you to wait a little while. Now, that was true of, of Paul, you remember. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, where you remember Paul describes what we think may have been a sickness in his eyes as a thorn in the flesh. And it's 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. And you see that he expresses plainly the belief that God had allowed this to come upon him for a spiritual reason and to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But here's the important thing, you see. He didn't just go on hoping and hoping. He received an answer from God. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then he said, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now that is God's will. That we should know what he intends in the sickness.
In other words, it is not his will that any of us should be under sickness for years and years and not know why it's there and not be clear whether God wants to heal it or not. God's normal attitude to sickness is, I want to heal all your sicknesses. I want to put none of them upon you that I've put upon the Egyptians. But you can see that at times, as in Paul's situation, he allowed a thorn in the flesh to remain and allowed Paul to glory, actually, in that weakness. Now, it's important, I think, to say, last of all, that some people go to the other extreme. And some people say, I have drawn close to God in my sickness. So really, I'd rather be sick than well. And so they accept sickness and welcome it and never look for healing at all. Now, do you see that that kind of holiness will not last? If you're only holy while you're sick, that is certainly not the Father's will for you. So it's not right ever to accept sickness as something that is God's will for you. you see. Sickness is never God's will for you. God may, through his permissive will, allow sickness to come upon you, but for a purpose and for a time, and then when the reason for that is removed, so the sickness will be removed. And so it is a lie of Satan for us ever to accept sickness as God's permanent will for us. And yet some of us, you see, glory in sickness in that way. Now, it's plain, you know, that sickness is not God's will. You can look up any place, really. But uh, John 9 and verse 3 is uh, a plain reason why we should never accept sickness. John 9 and 3. You remember they asked, did this man sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Now, the reason the sickness came was that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Now, that's why God allows sickness to come upon you. Now, if the sickness is not healed, then God's works are not made manifest in you. So, you see, there's no point if you accept sickness as a permanent part of your life then God is not glorified by sickness. In fact, only one person is glorified by sickness. And that is the one whom Jesus, you remember, said, really, he is the one that produces it. And it's Acts 10 and 38, and I think we looked at it last evening briefly, Acts 10 and 38. And uh, you remember Peter is talking about Jesus, and he talks about the works that Jesus did how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And the reason we should never accept sickness is that sickness is oppression by the devil. And we should never accept anything from Satan as a permanent work in our lives. So it's not right, you see, to say, oh, I have grown closer to God during this sickness. So really, sickness is good, and sickness will keep me close to God. No, God wants you to be rid of sickness, because sickness is a work of Satan, and God cannot be glorified in the midst of it. So, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of other things to say, and we'll share a little more of them next Sunday, but do you see that the basic attitude of Christians towards medicine should be not that we cannot use it, but that God has a perfect way. And the perfect way is to receive all healing and life from Jesus. And yet we have to deal individually with God about that. But if we ever do use medicine, we have to see that there are many cautions to be observed in the use of it, and we have to at least ascertain, is it God's will that we should use medicine? And yet we ought to see, you see, that it is easily and obviously God's will for many Christians to be in medicine because it's a beautiful opportunity to deal with a work of Satan and at the same time to have the opportunity to explain to someone that there is a better way and a fuller way for dealing with this sickness and for dealing with this enemy. Now, dear ones, would you like to question? Because I think that the questions are the most important.
part. We'll share a, a little more next Sunday. Christian science healings, are they sometimes of the devil or can they be, uh, I suppose, of God? I'm sure, sister, that there are many Christians uh, in all denominations or sects, even though we would think that no one could be a Christian scientist and still be a Christian, I'm sure there must be many dear souls who maybe don't see all the finer points of doctrine and maybe are real Christians in their own homes, and so they may well experience real healing from Jesus.